I came in just at the point, I think, when Mel was explaining some logistical things about today. Is this right? That we got to, sorry? Right, but, but also that there's only going to be one microphone running around the room for the second half and that we all have to clear out of here by 7.30 promptly because there's another event happening in here. I actually have to go over to the event that Larry needs to leave us for, for which I will be 45 minutes late. So let's try to make, the, I, it's, it, it's rather humbling to try to talk about King Lear in two hours. We'll do what we can, but I let me begin by saying that this is really an impossible and hubristic task and maybe you know, all too appropriate to the humbling that one is supposed to feel in the context of a text like this. Uh, as we begin, and I, there are various ways of trying to streamline what it is that we're going to do, or at least to focus in on the things that seem to interest you most, since we could spend the entire semester on it, and maybe someday we will. Uh, I, I wanted just to take a moment, uh, since this is a play that is especially problematic from the point of view of its text, to talk a little bit about Shakespeare's texts and how they come to us. Uh, there were some questions in terms of previous plays that we looked at as to whether Shakespeare had really written these plays, uh, how do we know what's a Shakespeare play and what isn't a Shakespeare play. So let me say just a couple of things about that in general and about these, these specific questions. Uh, we, we have uh, quartos and, fo and the first folio of Shakespeare's plays. We have nothing handwritten by Shakespeare uh, that, that we have for sure. We don't have personal letters, we don't have, uh, we have signatures, but we don't have any of his so-called foul papers, we don't have his manuscripts in the way, way that, that you would, might, might hope to have. Uh, so what we have are things that have been set in the print house and then sold either as quartos, official or unofficial, the small printed version, or published after his death by members of his company in the first folio of 1623. Uh, the uh, typesetting in this period is done by hand uh, and uh, is done by individual people with individual practices setting type. Uh, the, uh, how the words came to be set into type. Also, we can imagine a manuscript written by Shakespeare. We can imagine a manuscript that was written and then had additions added to it from what worked on stage and what changed from the point of view of its first production till the time that it was printed. Uh, plays in this period are often produced collaboratively, which is to say that there is not necessarily only one author, that a, a, a line or a scene might be augmented by another, another, another playwright. Uh, the, our notion that Shakespeare is an individual universal genius who writes in a little room by himself is very contrary to how plays are produced in this period. I want you to think more about how Hollywood scripts are produced, how uh, speeches are produced for, for, for politicians. These are often collective efforts, which doesn't mean that there isn't a lead author. And it doesn't mean when we have no evidence to say yes or no in cases like this that uh, lines, scenes, the whole play uh, could well be by William Shakespeare, whoever he was. Uh, in the case of Measure for Measure, I know that there were people who thought, well, gosh, you know, does Shakespeare really write about whores and brothels, and does he write so much prose? And so, yes, he does. And there is no evidence, whatever, to make, make us think that the play of Measure for Measure is not completely Shakespeare's. The only text that we have of it uh, is the text that we have in, in the first folio. Um, it's, there it is. And uh, the, the versions of it are, um, are, are, are developed uh, with, with editorial commentary. The, uh, so that what we need to do really is kind of open our minds to what it is that Shakespeare might do rather than say this isn't like Twelfth Night or this isn't like uh, The Merchant of Venice and so probably it's not Shakespearean, uh, but rather to widen our notion of what, what Shakespeare is and isn't. Now in the case of the play that we're looking at right now, it's a far more interesting textual situation because what we have, and you, if you looked at your, your edition carefully, you will have seen this, is basically two different plays uh, that there are two strongly different versions of the same play. Let me put it this way. Um, 
uh, again, this is not at all uncommon even in the modern theater, that you could try out a play in a certain way and then you would, would improve it or change it as it was produced. Uh, but there are two published versions of the play, uh, one, one a quarto and one the folio, that really differ very substantially to one another. There are whole scenes that are different, some are in and some are out, there are lines that are different. In some cases, whole speeches are given to different people. In one version, the last speech is given to Albany, in another version, the last speech is given to Edgar, and so forth. And for many, many, many years, uh, what playwrights, did, what, sorry, what, what editors did was to blend the two texts, say, taking what they thought were the best lines or what made, made the most sense. And so you had a text that was neither purely the folio nor purely the quarto. Uh, this gave you a Shakespeare, which was really, had no, had no claim to authenticity at all because it was in fact put together by an editor. I should say even to complicate this further that uh, the, the century after Shakespeare wrote this utterly brilliant and utterly devastating play, uh, looked at this play and said, well, it's a pretty good play, but of course, you know, he lived in a barbarous age and if he lived in a more sophisticated age, he would have written a better play. And so Nahum Tate, a playwright of the period and a poet of the period, revised Shakespeare's King Lear in 1681 uh, to give it a happy ending. So Cordelia lives and she marries Edgar. And it's much less horrible. Uh, the Dr. Johnson, Dr. Samuel Johnson, editing this play at the beginning or the mid middle of the 18th century, I should say, uh, said about the death of Cordelia, I am glad that I have finished my editing of this terrible scene. It is not to be endured. And so what the revised, the improved version of King Lear did was to, to make it more endurable, to make you suffer but also make you glad at the end. And before you laugh at this, let me inform you that this was the only version of King Lear that was performed on the English stage from 1681 into the middle of the 19th century. So if, as opposed to reading it, if you actually went to the theater, what you saw was Tate's King Lear. Uh, and uh, these, this is all the history of King Lear. These are all so that when you have critics writing about performances of King Lear, they're writing about a version of King Lear which is quite different from what you have read, and I'm betting that even if you own the Norton edition, which actually the, the, the big Norton Shakespeare, which prints three versions of King Lear, the 1609 quarto, so the, the, sorry, the, the, the quarto, the uh, folio, and also uh, the blended version, uh, that you will not have read all three and will have not come here prepared to sort of compare or contrast all three versions of this. This makes some people uneasy because they want there to be a text. But in fact, King Lear is a field of texts rather than only one. And what a, the same way a producer or a director or an actor will select out things in performance that you often will go to a production of any Shakespeare play and find that scenes are cut, not that the editor or the, the, the director has decided that this should be burned and never exist again, but that the playing time is too long or he or she wants more emphasis on Cordelia and less emphasis on the war or whatever it is. So that you often see in production a version of the play which is, is, is not identical to what you would read if you went to the store and bought yourself a copy of it. Uh, there are certainly cases in the modern theater. Uh, the uh, Tennessee Williams Cat on, a, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is a good example, in which the play went into production and people said, well, we don't like the ending. We want more of Big Daddy, the character, bring him back. And so Williams rewrote the ending. Uh, and uh, so we have then two versions of the play, one of which became the playing version. Uh, so here too we have, we have a version that is published as the history of King Lear, and we have a version that's published as the tragedy of King Lear. Uh, but they are not, you know, so easily assimilated to one or another of these genres. Uh, what the, the, the uh, and, and scholars have been very interested in this problem of the multiple King Lear, partly because, again, it get, gets rid of that or brackets that question about Shakespeare never having blotted a line of Shakespeare having you know, written exactly what he meant to write and no more and so forth, and instead replace this with the idea of Shakespeare the working playwright, of the difference between a performed version and a published version to be read, which is always the case. Some improvisations by characters will make it into the printed version and some will not. 
uh, that the play then exists really more as an artifact of its own time and as a truer um, example of how it is that playwrights at this exciting time for, for English writing actually did their work. Uh, so so I, I, I say this to you uh, in order to give you some sense that the, the text that we have goes through, goes the, through the print house, it is printed, it is published, it is purchased, it is sometimes censored, it is rewritten, it is reperformed. A lot of things happen to it, none of which make it not Shakespeare. Shakespeare is the totality of the things that have happened to this play. Shakespeare is not only the origin. Shakespeare is also the name that we give to the authorship of the play that we have. Uh, let me just pause for questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, does, does that sort of uh, broad definition of Shakespeare, does that include the conflated version of the two texts, or do you think it's more quote unquote purely Shakespeare to read one or the other of the text? It's a very good question and it's hard to answer because so many critical works and so forth have dealt with the conflated version of the, of the play, which is neither the one thing nor the other. With King Lear in particular, I think you have textual notes at the bottom of your page. It'll say F for folio or, or Q for quarto. Uh, but in, the, in, in any modern version, which I'm sure you all are reading, you'll find bracketed things or things with asterisks or in quotations, uh, making it actually quite hard to read transparently. Uh, the, the performing version is often a conflated version. There's not any particular fealty. Uh, Larry, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but, but uh, uh, there's not any particular fealty to performing one pure version or another. Uh, so that what, what you have is, from, uh, is, a, is an impure uh, muddling of the two to a certain extent, based upon somebody's editorial judgment about whether uh, two versions of a scene should both be there because one's in the quarto and one's in the, in the folio, or whether in fact uh, the second version seems to replace the first and that it would slow down the text to include both of them. Um, so, so Shakespeare here is the author of this text, but this text is in fact a conflated text. Are there are other questions? about this. This is very different from, from our modern notions of how copyright functions. Uh, yes, sir. Just wait, just wait for the microphone, please. I'm just wondering if there's any idea about who might have collaborated with Shakespeare or who might have been in collaboration In with some each other. cases, in the case of the late Shakespeare plays, sometimes it seems as if he collaborated with Fletcher or there, I mean, there, there, there are some cases in which there seems to be a kind of joint authorship, which is quite common in the period. For, in general, for Shakespeare, we don't have that. We have the suggestion that some of the scenes of Pericles were written by Peel. Uh, but but we, we don't have a, a, a strong sense of that. You have to, you have to. Uh, think, think, of, think of it as like a dormitory. Think of, think, think of all of these playwrights as existing in a small part of London which they're running around, you know, hanging out and drinking and showing each other exciting things and so forth. And, or, or think of it, if you like, in, 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 with the analogy of Rubens's painting studio in the same period where you've got you know, somebody doing the hands and somebody doing the faces and somebody doing the scenery and somebody doing the dead game and so forth because they're specialists in one thing or another. And uh, the, so, so you... you, you some people have tried very hard to say, aha, this is a phrase that I detect from, you know, sounds like Marlowe, it sounds like Peel, it sounds like Decker, whatever it is. I think for our purposes, this is really unuseful. Because the, because the point I want to really make to you is that this play is not only a Shakespeare play, but maybe the quintessential Shakespeare play. And to start saying, well, but I don't like this line, it's probably not Shakespearean, is, uh, that, the, that should be the last, last line of resort. What we should do instead is to sort of say, this surprises me, I didn't see this in Shakespeare's paint box or toolbox. This expands my notion of the, the, the range of interests that the Shakespearean corpus produces. Yes, one last question on this, and then let's turn to King Lear. Among the educated people at the time that Shakespeare was living, um, how well known was he outside of the direct people who saw the plays? I mean, would, you, would people read the plays, or you only knew Shakespeare if you saw the plays? 
Well, they, they, very often the playwright's name is not on the title page. It's the bookseller or the, the stationer that, that, that makes the money. And sometimes the name is on the title page and sometimes not. Different people have different notions about how well known he was. They, there was a lecture here a couple of weeks ago about the question of his celebrity in, or, or the question of whether he was celebrated in his own time. Most of the information that we have about this comes after his death when people tend to th sort of think backwards and to, to lionize someone. Uh, there are a few famous little contemporary jottings, somebody saying he thinks of himself as the only shake scene in the country, and, uh, in which, which it is suggested that rival playwrights thought of him as successful. But remember that he, that he is successful as running a theater that made money, too. His company was very successful, whether it's the plays or the success of the theater company that was being envied or talked about, it's hard to say. Uh, certainly our notion of greatness uh, is, again, a, 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 it's not a contemporary notion. For them, the great authors were the classical authors, not any living authors. And uh, our notion of Shakespeare's greatness is a fairly contemporary, I would say, you know, 18th century, 19th century notion, not a notion that would, would function at all in the 16th or 17th centuries. Okay? But he's great to us. So, and, and this surely is a, an extraordinary play. Uh, let's, so let's, let's see what we can do with it in the time that we have. There, there, um, uh, there are a number of different ways that we can approach it. One is to approach it thematically. One is to approach it scene by scene and speech by speech or in terms of character relations uh, and also in terms of keywords. So let us start with keywords just, just so that we make sure that we're dealing a little bit with language. Uh, what are some of the thematic actual words that show up throughout this play? The words that appear again and again. Patience. 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 Excellent. Okay. What else? Old. Sorry? Old. old. Oh, sir, you are old. In the back there. Yes, please. Fool. Fool. Okay. Good. How many different people get called fool? So who are they? The character called the fool. The fool, King Lear. King Lear. Kent. Kent. Cordelia. Cordelia for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Edgar when he's poor Tom, I think. No? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. But, but, but quite, it's, it becomes a disseminated term. That's, that's for sure. We've got a character who embodies it and who is like m most court fools, uh, a mirror of those things. What else? What are some other keywords? Sight and blindness, you bet. Absolutely. Okay. Nature. Nature. With a capital N and a small n. Okay. Good. What else? Nothing. 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 Okay. Great. Madness. Sorry? Madness. madness. Okay. Mad and madness. Oh, fool, I shall go mad. Okay. What else? Conceive, okay. Who conceives? Well, conceive is used in a lot of different ways. Give me some examples. Oh, I mean, uh, Lear is talking about the madness of conceiving. Ah, uh, the, the, the mother that rises within him. I'm not sure he uses the word conceive there, but maybe he does. Maybe he does. Certainly, the, when, when, when uh, Gloucester is talking about Edmund the Bastard, he talks about conception in that way. Um, and the, cons the mental conceit is also very much an issue here. What else? Bond. Bond. Okay, great. Accommodate. 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 Okay. An unaccommodated man, of course. Who is unaccommodated man? An accommodated man is just such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. It's Edgar as poor Tom, absolutely. Uh, who says this? Whose line is it? It's Lear's. Great. Children. Children. Okay. 
Okay, daughter, father, son. Where are the mothers? Son, sister. Excellent. Okay. And indeed, brothers. Okay. Yes, sir. I know what you said. The whole group of things like the eclipses and everything else, which are out there that are controlling things. Um, don't know what term you want to put to that. Well, why don't you just say eclipse? Because it, it's where these are. These are then. Uh, Celestial events, meteorological events, events that that. Okay, so this is this is an offshoot of nature, but it's actually also para nature, as you're suggesting. Yes. What else? Yes. Hand. Hand. Give me your hand. Absolutely. Yes. The gods. Gods. And who talks about them? They, yes, they, they, they name them, but it's also kind gods and oh ye gods and so forth. There is this, this uh, what, what's, what's, the, what's the setting of the play? When's it set? Pagan. Yeah, pa pagan, that, pr pagan, that is to say pre-Christian, supposedly. Uh, though obviously it's written in a very Christian age, so to speak. Remember that, that we have always with a play with a historical setting, it's apparent time of, of setting, the time which is written, and our own time, and the play really has been understood in very different ways in different modern periods. But there's already a tension between the, the ancient King Lear, L-E-I-R, uh, 800 BC, supposedly, um, or BCE, we should say, um, and the, 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 the time in which it is actually performed, uh, which uh, seems to many people to have a specific relevance to the history and politics of King James's time. We'll talk about that in a second. Any more of these thematic words that you want us to notice? Yes. Fortune. Okay. And uh, maybe the capital F, too. Smile once more, turn thy wheel. But remember fortune's wheel, that uh, mankind is at the top and doesn't know it and falls. And so this is kind of the medieval notion of tragedy. Yes? Heart. Heart. Heart, okay. Whose name has heart written all over it? Cordelia. Cordelia, okay. Is, is there any cause in nature that makes these hard hearts? Who are the hard hearts? The other daughters, the other daughters, yeah. Good, yes? Um, thank you. Um, it seems to me that there are a lot of words associated with being weak, um, tears and, 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 uh, and, and weeping, and a lot of words associated okay. with power and strength, and what those, and they are kind of inverted in the play in some ways. Yes, that's right. These become the power positions yes. that, 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 that precisely. I'll not weep, and then he does weep, and then that wonderful scene toward the end of the play in which Kent and an anonymous gentleman are talking about Cordelia's tears off stage, that her smiles and tears were like a better way, and that her tears were like pearls from diamonds dropped, and so forth. That's one of those things that I call in my book an unseen, something that takes place off stage that we, we seem to be present for. And the fact in this case that it takes place off stage allows it to be this fabulous passage of poetry. Uh, so yes, exactly. That these, that, that this, that these, what what seem to be the weak positions turn out to be the strong positions. What seem to be the strong positions turn out to be the weak positions. What would be so? These would be the the, the weak slash old or female uh, behaviors, so to speak. What would be some of the supposedly uh, strong or empowered positions at the end that then turn out to be, by contrast, disempowered? Can you think of any specifically? Yes. Well, the fathers, the fathers, the patriarchs, okay. the kings. The Good. All right. So we've got, we've got. Let's let's say it. We've got patriarchy. That's what we've got. We've got fathers. We've got kings and dukes. We've got rank. We've got a play that in which the you, I think you want to imagine the great procession at the beginning of the play 
as involving the men of rank before the women. Uh, here's a king with three daughters. Um, the daughters are in this situation that we've seen in other kinds of plays in which the traffic in women is going to take place, that these are alliances that are happening, that the daughters are being married. And it's a, one of the topsy-turvy things here is that these women become empowered and they become so empowered that King Lear says, you know, uh, the, uh, about Goneril, uh, that, that she uh, dry up in her the organs of increase, that she is so male that she really should no longer bear children. And this, 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 this dangerous crossover between maleness and femaleness, which we see in The Weeping and the Tears, is also emblematized in, these, in, the, in what seems to be the empowered daughters, especially Goneril. And we'll see, when we get to Lady Macbeth, we'll see a version of this as well. So the question about what real strength is, uh, is, is, is thematized here and is related in some interesting way to gender as well as to social hierarchy and to power. Uh, because the disempowered figures are peasants, country people, they're all the, all the, the, the people in, in Edgar's repertoire, all the different people whom Edgar acts out. Uh, but also the, the old, also the either literally or, or uh, metaphorically blind. Uh, the, these, the, these become, not only for us as readers of the play, but even within the play, the figures of, of a surprising power. Uh, so, all right, these, so this, this is, so we could, we, I could erase the board, we could fill the board with, with another set of words like this, uh, but I, I uh, this is a very good selection to deal with. This is a play uh, which is, which, in which metaphorical language is very much present. That the long passages of, of poetry, and we'll look at some of them, in which the, 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 uh, the eyeless storm, for example, will be discussed. Uh, and, and, and this will, you know, then, then be thematized in the blinding of Gloucester later on. See better Lear, Kent will say to him at the beginning of the play. And this, this theme of, of, of blindness, of uh, not being able to see when you actually can see, turns into the paradox that, 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 that uh, when the minute Gloucester is blinded, remember he says, where's my, where's my son Edmund? And the answer is what? Yes. They indicate that uh, he is the one who has uh, betrayed him. Exactly. You speak of one who hates you. Exactly. Then, oh, oh, uh, kind, oh, oh, some kind of gods. Then Edgar was betrayed. That 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 that, that I I mistook my son Edgar. So he he has a revelation at the moment of his blindness. And that, I mean, it, doesn't, I mean, it is so powerful a structure that it seems ridiculous to call it merely a paradox, but it is one of the functions uh, of, of, of reversal in this play. That uh, when people think that they see most, they see least. When people think that they are, that, that, that Lear wants so much to feel patience uh, and uh, cannot at the beginning of the play, and then the ultimate figure of patience in the play becomes Gloucester, who suffers and endures, uh, ripeness is all. Uh, again, the, the, the play has so imbued our time that it's certainly like Hamlet in that, that all these lines seem to us unbelievably familiar and powerful. Uh, I, let's talk a little bit about structures within the play. So we took the, this notion of Fortune's wheel, for example, could be thought of as one of the, the over, over arching structures of the whole play, that, that, that just when you think you're at your strongest point, so you reach your, your, your lowest point. Who gives voice to that sentiment in the play? The fool does. When does he do that? Or maybe just at the end of... Act one. I can't remember. He's saying, "Follow the wheel. Let the wheel carry you." Up. Yeah. The, the uh, you know, first he doesn't want it. First, well, first he says, "You know, uh, that, that that you should attach yourself to the man whose wheel is going up, not the man whose wheel is going down." 
Um, and the fool does try at certain points to say, you know, uh, don't go into the storm, go into where it's warm, don't experience this, this, um, uh, this, this cataclysm that happens in the storm scene. But ultimately, there is a sense in which, yes, go ahead, please. Sir. You were saying where he says it. Yes. I think he says it to Kent. Where's Kent at that point? He's in the stocks. In the stocks, yeah, yes, right. yes. Um, uh, where you learned you that fool, not in the stocks, fool, says. The, the, so the question again is which handy dandy, which is the fool, which is the wise man, which is the king, which, which is the highest, which is the lowest. This is the Duke of Kent, after all. First disguised and then imprisoned. It's very clear that being put in the stocks is a, is a, is a, 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 a very low class punishment. Uh, not something that you do for noble people. Yes. Um, the Wheel of Fortune, um, Edmund at the end of the play. Yes. Um, thou hast spoken right, is true. The wheel has come full circle. I am, I am here. here. Yeah. I am here. Absolutely. That's that, that um, this. And, and, but, but also, I, I want to add to this that moment when Edgar sees the blind Gloucester and says, who, who is it who can say, I, this is the worst? I am worse than ever I was. Uh, you, the, you, you're not at the worst so long as I can say this is the worst. So long as you can put a whole sentence together. So he is conscious of being at the bottom and of realizing that he's probably not yet at the bottom. So that there's a way of, of inhabiting that wheel as well as referring to it, so to speak. And both of those things are happening in this play. Uh, at the same time, that this is not so much a play about retribution. It's not a play about cycles so much as it is about, about losing and finding, about the necessity to lose in order to find, about the, uh, the, 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 the question of making, of, of doing exactly what, what, what Lear says he cannot do to make something out of nothing. Uh, that's in a certain way what happens throughout this play and especially toward the, toward the end of it. Um, in order for there to be a fall, there has got to be an established position. Let me ask you whether you see yourselves uh, this play as predominantly, if you had to code it as a tragedy or as a history play, or, or a, uh, what do you see as its, its primary field of reference? Is it, is it for you a play about England and France, uh, about uh, King James, about what, 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 what do you see as it being about? We've talked about its themes a little bit. Yes. I really see it as a relentless um, downhill slide for a, a man who makes a decision that we call heroic, but in, in, in he's accommodating to coming to terms with dying eventually. This, so, 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 do, so for you, the notion that he is a king is, so to speak, a metaphorical thing, that by king, uh, king to you in your response to the play means uh, man at the height of his powers, right. rather than person who is employed to run a country. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is very <laughs> much how the last century has tended to respond to this play. Uh, and, and I want to put it in balance with the political reading of the play because a lot of people read the play really about either the man coming to terms with his own mortality, uh, about the father and the daughter, or about the question of the family and so forth. But, but it's also important to bear in mind that this is very much a play about British politics and about, about, about history, that Albany and Cornwall describe that these titles do describe parts of England, that Albany is, is nominally the part called Scotland, and that Cornwall is the, the west of England, that uh, the ancient story, your footnotes will have told you that the ancient story about King Brutus, the first king of Britain, involved sons who were, who, who, not daughters, but sons who represented these two parts, and that also it's the case that King James, who had two sons, uh, gave them titles of Cornwall and Albany, and that, that there's a sense that it, there's this kind of notion of thickness, of things happening over and over again, uh, and of the pathos of the play, the, 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 the human drama of the play, which we respond to so powerfully, also being in dialogue with history, so that it's not uh, forgettable. 
that this is also a play about, it's about union and disunion to, to British politics in this period, of course, disunion, the division of the kingdom. And that, when I read, read through the play again the last couple of days, I was very struck by the repetition of the word division, which I'd never noticed before as repeating itself over and over again, that it begins at the very beginning of the play. But then we hear in the middle of the play, there is division between Cornwall and Albany, that the division here meaning divisiveness as well as, as, as geographical sundering. But this, so, so this is very much a, a, a play in its own time about the dangerousness of asking people to part a coronet between them, of trying to split up a country. Yes? In, in addition, it seemed to me that the vulnerability of, and the artifice of uh, the established um, hierarchy or of power itself, how, how easily it um, is vanquished by by the natural, I mean, like Edmund, or primarily, or, or a bad decision. Well, oh no, yeah, okay. There, there, so we, there'd be two things. Remember, that's, this is well to remind us that there are two plots going on here. That this is a play of double plot. That we have the Gloucester plot and the Lear plot, and that the play really begins with with Kent and Gloucester talking about how they think the king felt about Albany and, and Cornwall. Uh, but we very, very early on get the story of what's going on in the Gloucester family with the two sons, as well as what's going on in the Lear family with the three daughters. And the, the, what, happens to, what happens in the Gloucester plot is actually different from what happens in the Lear plot. Because it, as you say, in the case, case of Lear, he makes a decision, or he seems to make a decision. In the case of Gloucester, he is actively hoodwinked by the plotting of Edmund. That, that Ed, you remember the whole scene with the letter, what are you doing with the letter? Uh, oh, nothing, the quality of nothing has not such a need to hide itself and so forth. That, they, that, 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 that Ed, Edmund is, is the Machiavelli figure, the Iago figure, the figure who is planning, who conceives of. This, this usurpation. So it's, what happens in the two households is slightly different. Uh, in fact, it's very different. Uh, and if, if one wanted to look at it as a kind of moral fall, uh, you could say that maybe that Gloucester is not skeptical enough, but, it, but, it's, but it's, not, it's not at all the same as his making a, uh, I mean, he makes a snap judgment, but it's not the same kind of judgment that, that, that Lear makes. Um, so how, would you tie, how are you tying those two things together? Edgar and, the, and Lear's decision? Well, it, it seemed to me that, that Lear's initial d decision to break up the kingdom, I mean, was it you or somebody else asked the question, was he mad at the beginning to have initially proposed this breakup of his kingdom? And it seemed to, to me that um, he very quickly understood how um, that bad decision um, destroyed him, destroyed everything that he believed in. Um. Uh, it's, uh, certainly it's presented as a, uh, there are two bad decisions. There's the division of the kingdom at all, as you're suggesting, and there's his uh, rejection of Cordelia, or his refusal to, to hear what she is saying as an affirmation rather than a negation. So these are two kinds of decision. Uh, and one could, to say that he's mad at the beginning seems to vitiate the whole question of his, his growth or change throughout the whole play. It would make it much more static if he were merely performing the same thing over and over again. What, what I try to argue in my, my writing about this play is that what begins metaphorically then becomes literal. That, that when people are using figures of speech like eyeless and nothing, and, and that, that then what happens in the middle of the play in the storm scene is that all those things become literalized and that, that, that what seem like extravagant figures of speech become horrible visual truths. Yes? Um, when you were talking about the um, British um, historical situation, I thought of another couple of words that didn't make it up there but might have made it up there, which is uh, chaos and order, uh -huh. um, and that those... Uh, again, are both external and internal things that we see in the, in the play. Right. Remember that, that when we were looking at Troilus and Cressida, we spent a lot of time on, on Ulysses' speech on degree. This is very much a play about what happens 
when degree is shaped, when, when, when the, the sons rule the father, when the daughters rule the father, when the uh, nature takes over in every possible way. And you get wonderful passages about that. Yes? I think part of the reason that there's, that it's so hard to um, find a clear line between the, the political or historical and the personal, more personal and tragic aspects of the play is that um, we don't see any of Lear's subjects or former subjects, we, we hardly see any of them who are not very closely connected with his household in some way. You know, Kent was not a member of his household, but was, we get the impression, a trusted advisor and similar with uh, Gloucester, I believe. And so, you know, there's not, um, it, it, the, um, the context, portray, I think, portrays Lear more as more within the, it's more within the context of his family than within the context of his kingdom. And it's sometimes, I think, for people not living in a monarchical society, it's hard to look beyond that and look at the political and historical aspects of it. Well, but suppose that this play were about George W. Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld instead of about Lear and Gloucester and Kent. These would be also people or about, about Gonzales or about, I mean, these would also be people that you would think of in very intimate relation to the ruler, who are his advisors, whose personal quirks he takes on board, for whom there might be, and, and we, wouldn't, we wouldn't say, well, this is just a family drama. I mean, we might say that, but, but, but it has consequences, it has political consequences because of who they are. So I, I, I think, I, I mean, I think it is a, a modern appropriation of the play to see it as a family drama, and that we don't lose anything by also restoring to it this, this other dimension. I think it's really our unfamiliarity with these figures or with the political discourse of the time. Uh, but if we think about our own political moments, if we think about, about, about Nixon or about Clinton or about, uh, you can see how the, political and the personal are really very hard to divorce from one another. Yes, down here, please. Um, I was just thinking about language and the double um, meaning of mad, um, and that when somebody is in a blind rage, they are crazy. And it seems to me that um, that happens to Lear, that happened to Othello, and I was just sort of playing with that notion. And Cordelia and Edgar never get angry. They're forgiving, they don't get mad, and Lear and Gloucester um, it's like one strike and you're out, um, and their children are banished. Well, they remember they have the power, too. That, 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 uh, this is an example of what I was talking about, about the sort of unmetaphoring of things happens when, in, the little, in, the little, in the quarrel between Kent and Lear, when, when uh, Lear, Kent says to him, what wouldst thou do, old man? And Lear, uh, the, uh, Lear reproves him for this re reference, and, and, Lear, and Kent says, be can't unmannerly when Lear is mad. Now, he's not mad in the dissociated sense in which we see him in the middle of the play, in the storm, taking the people for stools and stools for people and so forth. He is mad in our more modern sense of, of uh, uh, not making good judgments, behaving in a way that's, that, that's very inappropriate. And the, but it's still a figure of speech so to speak, when, when, when Kent addresses it to him. I understand that, but the, the notion of people getting angry happens a lot in this play. Yes. People are very quick-tempered, and they get angry, they right. get mad right. a lot. Right. And I thought that was interesting, um, that the children um, treat the parents like children. Yes. They forgive them. Right. Um, they don't get mad. Well, the, no, right, they don't, they don't, Cordelia they, and Edgar, I mean, the, the, the other, um, Goneril and, and Regan are mad all the time. Well, yeah, I, it doesn't know, I mean, they, they are, the, they're impatient. I mean, I think this notion of patience plays into this idea of madness when you say, you know, one strike and you're out or whatever it is. But, 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 but uh, I mean, notice how quickly uh, the power shifts from the, uh, the end of that, that, that ceremonial scene 
Uh, we hear the two elder daughters saying, you see how full of changes his age is, but he's ever but slenderly known himself, that, that you suddenly get the backstory about they never did respect him or think that he was so powerful. Now, that, that's, that's a slight, you know, we don't know whether we, if we had been a scene before, scene zero before the play began, they would have said, our father is full of changes, we can't wait till he gives away the kingdom. This is something they say after this happens, and it's as if they're, misremembering. I mean, is, he may have been changeable before or not, but they now have the power and they can reposition him as the child. And that's what they do, basically. They infantilize him. They make him play tricks. They make him kneel. They, 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 and, and he begins to act out, really, in front of them to get their attention. Uh, so that, that losing the, the, the position of father, patriarch, king. And these things are, they're not the same except allegorically. They're not the same except mythologically. Uh, but they're, they're, they're stuck on top of one another. When, when, uh, when fairy tales or when Freud talks about princes and kings, we often forget that they're written by people who actually lived in societies with princes and kings, that these aren't merely allegorical figures for fathers and children. These are also things that have a political relevance or reference. They, these references have dropped out for us, and we think of these as merely a king must be an empowered man, and so he is. But it's true that 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 uh, uh, that certainly the whole first scene is very much a scene of impatience of of his. Uh, uh, partly because I mean, we talked a little bit when we talked about Othello about the degree to which the play was a play about scripts and playwriting and designing scenes and so forth. And this is very much a scene or a ceremonial that has already been pre-designed. Uh, in some productions of the play, the map already has the divisions marked on it. There's some productions in which you get a little piece of the map that's already, you know, the, the little map quest section of the map that is being given to you. Uh, there's, there, the, uh, she's supposed to play her part. She's supposed to say, and, 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 and everything seems very, very rehearsed. And so her, her refusal to participate in this scriptedness is also something that infuriates him. It's also a sign immediately of his lack of control. The question of loyalty and the, the self-aggrandizement of, of I suppose you call it egotism, you know, whether it be um, the bastard who wants his legitimate rights because he feels he's left out or the daughters well, who want them. I mean, but these are human conditions. They're not, I mean, um, they're human things rather than historical. I mean, they don't have to uh, go with... How can we distinguish the human from the historical? Well, I don't, but you were, I thought, I, mean, I thought you were, you know, because you had somebody who said it was a family thing, of which these things definitely come in. Right. And, um, and then you say, no, that's really sort of historical, you know, because it's, it's part of kingship, it's part of uh, patriarchy. I mean, loyalty, the system works on loyalty, patriarchy, all these things. Um, and you break it down, you know, when you start thinking about yourself, mainly. Um, well, it doesn't matter if we, had, if we, if we had begun with the political, I would have said, but it's also familial. Yeah. The, my point is not to say that it's this, not that, but rather to say that it's very hard to take these things apart from one scene, another. Yeah. That, well, that, that, that they are, are uh, layered upon one, there are many different levels, so to speak, on which you can encounter what happens in these scenes. And that the history of law, the history of politics, is not, is not an unhuman, it's not like this nature outside things. That, that I mean, the, 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 uh, when Edmund gives his wonderful speech, thou nature art my goddess, to thy law my services are bound, uh, this is, you could well find a footnote in your book that talks about the, the, the refusal of the law at the time to give uh, lands and power to people illegitimately born. Uh, how we feel about that is up to us, maybe, but, but, but his, this is not motiveless malignity in quite the same sense that we might have, have talked about it in terms of Iago, although there is the same kind of sense of, a, of, of, of I must make myself into a powerful figure because I have nothing to authorize myself except, except my own wit and my own, own rhetorical cleverness. But it's, I, I, I'm not myself a particularly historical or historicist critic. I would never say it's just history in this sense. I just want you not to forget that the particularities of the plot uh, also have a historical resonance. 
and that there are some moments when that, remember we talked the other day about, about, about the, the transparencies, or the anatomical transparencies that show you the, the inner organs and the bones and the, 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 that if you look at you know, the, the frog or the human body in your encyclopedia that you'll find that. But that here too, these, these are different layers of, of signification that go into making the play as powerful it is, as it is. It's about this play, in fact, that Yeats used this wonderful phrase, emotion of multitude. That, that seems to me to, to, to explain very much why it seems so resonant, precisely because it is not merely local and not merely historical and not merely transcendent, but somehow all of those things at once. I guess picking up on the, the feeling who owns anger and who doesn't, in the play, uh, I'm struck by the trajectory of uh, Lear's life, that he gets to have all of the feelings, and his daughters don't. Uh, there's the angry, you know, primitive Goneril and Reagan, and there's Cordelia, who's very loving, and yet there's Lear, who has just about, you know, he goes through everything, his anger, his rage, and he finds his love. And. Uh so, I'm, I'm just struck by it as, as to the, ro the legacy to his daughters who die, that they were never complete in a way. Well, we, we don't see the play so directly from their perspective. One, one could imagine a production that wanted to, that, that, I mean, let's imagine a production in which we began with a spotlight, and the spotlight was on Goneril. I mean, not even on Cordelia, but on Goneril. So that you were, by a trick of staging, really made to, to focalize, as they say in the reading of novels, to look at what's happening in the play from the point of view of a character who wasn't the title character or the supposed major character of the play. Uh, there would be, and if you were the actress playing Goneril, you would presumably have to imagine all of these relations from your own point of view. It's uh, certainly true that Lear is in, in both scenes and is talked about a great deal, and that, and that the, the, the Lear of the daughter's imaginings is really their imagination of him, not necessarily the him that we see. Uh, but uh, is it that you think that, that, that this is a, a, a flaw in the play or a... a Do you think they're not? Do you think that, that, that there are things about Goneril and Regan that, uh, that we don't, that dimensions of, of the female characters in the play say that we don't see where we see dimensions of Lear? Please. There, there doesn't seem to be, other than the fact that we might feel sorry for them because their father favored their sister. Other than that, there's nothing good about them. And to have characters be so one-dimensional, maybe that's what you're suggesting. I don't know. Do you, does everybody agree that these characters are one-dimensional? I mean, they, for example, how about their relationship to Edmund? How about the, the, the moment when they're both in love with Edmund? And when they, you know, first they're both in love with the father, and this fails. Then they're both in love with Edmund. The persons they're not in love with are their husbands, who are accessories. Uh, I wouldn't, I mean, to my mind, it's not really love, but what, what do I know? Uh, their relationship to Edmund isn't really love. So, well, this is certainly qualitative distinction. So, so, so is there any love in the play? I don't think there's any love in them. I think there's love in the play, and I think maybe that's the point, that, that it's so distinct, the lovelessness of those daughters and the lovingness of Cordelia. Well, supposing I say I think Cordelia is a complete wimp and it's a terrible part, um, <laughs> and that the, the only good scene she has is the scene with the, the, the you do me wrong to take me out of the grave scene in which she gets to replay, I wrote this in my chapter, gets to replay the speak don't speak scene of the opening where we're in the, in the first scene, 
Uh, he says, what can you say? She says, nothing, my lord. In the second scene in Act 4, she has learned that she actually must speak. And she speaks still in the negative. He says, you know, they, your sisters have, have uh, uh, done me wrong. Uh, you have some cause, I, they have none. And she says, no cause, no cause. So she, she speaks again in the negative, but her negative is a positive. Her negative was a positive to begin with. He just didn't understand that it was a positive. So he becomes a better reader uh, as he, as he uh, but, but she also becomes a better speaker. But I would say that, I mean, I love the speech and I, I, I moves me to, to close to tears myself when I actually perform that, that interaction. But it's, you know, it's because of the pathos of his position, you do me wrong to take me out of the grave and so forth. And with a little pause where she says, no cause, no cause. But, but I, 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 you know, for character, give me Regan any time. It's a, it's a more interesting character, I think, uh, which doesn't mean that she's a better person. Yes? Well, um, I think part of the reason that they appear uh, one-dimensional is that they are, they, is that the, the play does, the, the audience does see the play primarily, or the play, ha the parts of the play that have to do with them, primarily through Lear's perspective um, and partially through Kent's perspective, and he's obviously very closely tied to Lear. I mean, what if Goneril really is just worried about these, you know, these big, loudy knights who, uh, who are, you know, trampling all over her house and getting into fights in the great room and, you know, well, this drinking? Is, I'm very glad you bring this up because this is one of the undecidables in the play that some productions will emphasize, again, the footnotes in my edition are full of, you know, ex-director had lots of knights on the stage and they were rowdy, no, no, these other ones are, uh, the, uh, depending upon whether or not you believe them when they say that the knights are disruptive, um, I mean, here you are, you have taken your aged parents into your home and they have brought with them their, you know, 12 dogs and their, you know, they, they, uh, the, 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 this is not a completely unimaginable scenario and they're, you know, canasta partners and they're, they want to watch their own television programs, not your television program, that they're in your space, that there's this sense in which they're, it, so this would be, again, the, 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 the might be illegitimate appropriation of the play into the, the modern period, but the, it's not clear about these knights whether they are rowdy or not, and they're performed in slightly different ways. What is striking, however, is, it, is that wonderful scene in which, which uh, and, and again, I talk about that in my, in my chapter, when, 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 when he, quanti once again, is quantifying love, and you know, you're 50 or more than the, the, double her, her five and 20, and thou art twice your, your, her love. And uh, not altogether so, my lord. Uh, the, the, the kind of cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting down. What need once? You wind up with none again. Uh, so that the, the, the knights have, again, a, a, a function to, under, to explain his, the, the, the degree to which he's trying to quantify love rather than to, to, to understand it. But this question about whether the, the elder daughters have any justice in their claim that this is a disruptive situation is, uh, is not explicit in the play, is, is, a, is something available to be developed by performance. We're going to have to pause and then we'll come back in five minutes. When we do, uh, I'd like to look at some scenes as well, just so that we can look at some passages. I'm going to erase all this stuff on the board and we're going to try to collect some scenes. So welcome back. Um, so we had a little, some unfinished business. We had a few questions left over, which let's, let's do those. And then I will want us to look at some. Yes. My question has more to do with the historical background of the play. Uh -huh. James was actually trying to unite exactly. Scotland and England. Right. So why this is a bad example. This is, th this is a, once upon a time, King Lear divided the kingdom and you saw how terrible that was. So I am reversing. It's the the the. It's like like a, a, a tape in reverse of you what of a of a uh, what do I want to say a, a tidal wave that you see the tidal wave and then you see it undo itself. <laughs> and so so he it, he used this as a moral example and historical example of I because not everybody wanted the union of Scotland and England. This, he obviously wants it because he's the king of Scotland and also now the king of England. So he wants to unify the two countries. So this is a political argument appealing to history, as we might appeal to the Founding Fathers or something like this. But in this case, it's a bad example from the past that we are going to try to undo. Thank you for your question. Uh, well, no, we, I, a moment ago, you had this in your own hand. OK. Yes. Um, I was thinking with the, uh, that 
great scene where the numbers of attendants were reduced from 100 to 50 to 25 to 10 yeah. to 5, that that really went to the political slash historical versus family question, because you can look at that at one side, that the daughters didn't want all these raucous uh, nights in their house, but it's also an indication that they, they're just expressing to Lear, we're taking your power away from you. If you're a king, you have 100 attendants, but in fact, you don't need any. Well, the, 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 again, when he says that he wants to unburden crawl toward death, this, this inadvertent image of himself as a child, that he does not see that as, I mean, the, the, the irony of the opening scene is partly that he does not understand the implications of the imagery that he is mobilizing here. And when he says that only we will rename, retain the name and the addition of a king, now an addition is again a title. So you'll see, we'll see when we come to Coriolanus that, that Coriolanus, because he's a Roman, has many different parts to his name. One of many, the name Coriolanus itself means the guy who won the town of Cor Coriolis. It's like you know the desert fox or something would be an addition, would be a nickname that describes your, your exploits. So in this case, the addition is the name King Lear. And the problematic of the play is what is Lear when he is not King Lear? Um, and he turns out, to be nothing or everything. He, that, that, that he, first he learns that he is nothing, as was said to him, and then he learns that nothing is everything. That in fact, uh, in, this, in the scene where he, in Cordelia, the third scene, the, the third scene which features them so prominently, in which he, he talks about how we two alone will sing like birds in a cage. He, he has this fantasy of their being alone together in prison, away from the world, abandoning the world again and where they will constantly perform this, you know, you, you'll, you'll, uh, I, I'll ask of thee forgiveness and so forth, and we'll sing and, and tell old tales, that he has this fantasy of, of leaving the world altogether, but, uh, at, which obviously can't come true, and, and turn, is, is the sequel to this, of course, is her death. But the, the, uh, the political and the personal here are, both for the characters in this play and differently for us tied together. And I, I, I've oversimplified a little bit, but I want to repeat my oversimplification mm -hmm. that it could well be that in the 17th century, so to speak, the uh, political is the first level at which you encounter it and the, the human domestic the next one Whereas for us, we, in, we, we, we enter through the human domestic and then recover the political. But the question of the domestic, let me just say a word about this too. The question of the domestic comes in, is thematized in this play in the, in the crucial question of hospitality, uh, of the, the, the extraordinary violation of Gloucester's hospitality, uh, that, which again is a question that we'll see repeated in Macbeth when the murder of the king happens when he's a guest. Uh, it's a double violation of hospitality here. And here, too, it's in his own house that he is treated so badly. And this question of, the, of the, the domestic and the household versus the world out there. So, so that the, 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 the great third scene, the third act of this play, is cross-cut between the scenes in the storm and the scenes in the house of Gloucester. And uh, the, I think there's not even any question as to which are the cruel or more painful scenes. It's the scenes inside, not the scenes outside, the scenes of human cruelty, not of natural encounter. So that this, this, this question of what's the public and what's the private, or what's the inside and what's the outside, uh, is, as we say, problematized in this play from the very beginning. Yes? Um, I, just, I just wanted to speak to the, the kind of visceral reaction one has of either reading or seeing this play. Yeah. <clears throat> because I've, over the course of my life, I've done it in various stages, and I'm aging myself now, and it, it, it hits you differently. But it's so horrible. Uh, you know, it's, it's so cruel. It's so kind of bleak. Uh, you know, I mean, that's... Obviously, it's many other things as well, but that that part of it is so amazing to me. Every time I read it, I'm so struck by. 
I was thinking in it, this the kind of planet Earth thing of the, you know, the predators and the prey, and the, yeah. it, it's so much this kind of, well, the old generation's gonna, it, you know, you're old, you're done, get out of here. You know, I mean, to the, even that out, out vile jelly thing. I mean, it's, it's unbearable. I can see why someone would rewrite the ending, would want to rewrite the ending, because, even though, you know, Lear sees finally and there's this, you know, this is reconciliation and everything, he's he's not allowed a moment to kind of, you know, appreciate that before Cordelia's hanged and he's he dies. I mean, it's... It is it's unrelentingly a devastating. tragic. It is true. That's, it is I just true. wanted to kind of speak to that reaction because... But it, but, but it, it gets to this tragic core, so to speak, through, among other things, moments of comedy, the, the, when, when he uh, uh, talks about the new pranks of his daughters and, and, and they, or he, they talk about his new pranks and his mumming and so forth, that uh, when the fool's various either scatological or, or pornographic puns and jokes, uh, the, uh, the, there, there are many moments of either comedy or romance in the play, romance in that sense of fairy tale, of you know, the, the, the lost is found and the reunion. And the, 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 again, the, the, the extraordinary scene at Do Dover Cliff, the, the scene in which Gloucester is led to the edge of something he thinks is Glo Dover Cliff and he's blind and he jumps. And again, how do you perform this so that it's not Charlie Chaplin, or if it is, it's pathos through Charlie Chaplin, that in fact, the fact that he is that it's not sublime makes it sublime. The fact that it is not, in fact, a leap from a great height, but that the sublimity is inside. That is the it's the the idea that he has fallen from a great height that 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 converts him. And that wonderful scene again. It's an unseen. It's a, it's a it's a passage that describes something that we do not encounter, in which the disguised Edgar says, you know, look up to the, first he says, look down. First he says, I, I, I see the, the one, halfway down hangs one that, that gathers samphire, dreadful trade, and the, 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 I see a boat in the distance, it's, it's buoy almost Im imperceptible to me, and so forth, that, that, that he, he evokes in language this, this, this vista of great distance, uh, which is absolutely not there on the stage. That this is the effect of sublimity that happens as a result of it not being sublime, so to speak, of it being actually uh, a mental act to encounter the sublime. And, uh, and, and so the, the, the play has lots of it, has romance moments, has comedy moments, it has historical moments, it has battles, and it has, has challenges and fights in which Edgar at the end is, is, is masked and it seems to be like apocalypse and it seems to have a kind of biblical resonance and so forth. The play mo mobilizes many different stage languages and, and, and metaphorical languages in order to get to, in order to paint you this picture of, of, of encountering with the thing itself. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's, it's nihilism is, is, so to speak, a sumptuous nihilism. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not emptied out. It's the, it's, it's, it's gets to this nihilism through language. And when you get finally, as, uh, remember Othello's breakdown with the noses, ears, and lips, and so forth, when you get never, 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 or kill, 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 uh, when, when, when in fact, again, syntax breaks down for Lear, you're at the verbal thing itself, from which, again, the play will recover into language, as happened, again, with Othello. Mel. Professor Grover, could I just add to what you were just saying a bit, too, getting back to the uh, vile jelly, out-out vile jelly, which is one of the most terrible things in a, t in a ter terrible play. Um, I don't remember, is it in the, if it's in the, um, is it in the folio or the quarto where we have the additional scene with the servants afterwards, um, where Gloucester is put out of doors and then the servants actually follow him and say they're going to take care of him. And I don't remember, for those of you that have the Norton, if Professor Lewalski's uh, conflated version has that. Is it in there? I mean, that's such a fascinating instance of the redemption of nihilism at the same time right. that you have nihilism going on because when you think about the substance of an eye and what it would be like once it's disembodied from the human head, it's, it's awful. And then the servants um, take upon themselves the task of redeeming that materiality in some way by saying, well, we'll make a poultice and we'll, we'll, we'll make it out of flax and egg whites, right, very right. viscous substances that are quite like the human eye. And their attempt is so futile on the one hand because where do you put a poultice on an absence? 
are they putting it on the eyelids? Are they putting it where the eyes were supposed to be? But at the same time, there's a great restoration of humanity and their attempt to just do something for him, even though there's really nothing that can be done. And also, just, just to add to that, there's, of course, the, the lonely heroism of Cornwall's servant, who yeah. attempts to intervene and who, 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 again, has an appeal to the fealty of the servant. You know, that I've, I have served you all my life, but greater service did I never do than now to bid you hold. That this, this, this rebellion against service in a, which is, it's a version of what Kent did. It's a version, you know, that the loyal servant sees better. And uh, that, but the fact that this is a servant, not a nobleman, that again, the scene is, is very visceral rather than merely the loss of a kingdom, it's the loss of an eye. Uh, and that the, the, the death of the, of the servant also leads to the death of Cornwall and therefore to many of the political th things that happen at the end of the play. Uh, let's, let's, can, can we, uh, localize a couple of scenes. We've talked a little bit about the Dover Cliff scene. We've talked a little bit about the opening scene. Uh, we, uh, I, but I'd like for us to look at at least one or two of these great passages together and see how they work. Yes. Um, I, I think probably I think probably uh, you would have a better um, idea of this, but. Can we talk about a scene that sort of exemplifies what a scene that you think exemplifies the fool, and he's he's sort of a um, he's he's such a many-sided character um, that I just think that I, I find myself rereading the scenes that he's a part of. Well, all right. Let's 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 look at the fool early then in Act One, Scene Four. Um, at the moment when the fool is performing his court function, before he becomes uh, himself a sublime figure, about line 125, Act 1, Scene 4, about line 125, um, in, uh, at, at a point when he is still uh, performing a little bit. Uh, and uh, have more than thou showest, speak less than thou knowest, lend less than thou owest, ride more than thou goest, learn more than thou trowest, set less than thou throwest, leave thy drink and thy whore, and keep indoor, and thou shalt have more than two tens to a score. Two, ten, two tens are a score, of course, it's twenty. This is nothing, fool, says Kent, fool, then tis like the breath of an unfeed lawyer, you gave me nothing for it. Can you make no use of nothing, nuncle? And here's, he's addressing Lear. Why, no boy, nothing can be made out of nothing. Fool to Kent, prithee tell him so much the rent of his land comes to, he will not believe a fool. Lear, a bitter fool. Fool, dost thou know the difference, my boy, between a bitter fool and a sweet one? Lear, no lad, teach me. So he's still prepared to be entertained. That lord that counseled thee to give away thy land, come place him here by me, do thou for him stand. The sweet and bitter fool will presently appear, the one in motley here, the other found out there. So what's the fool doing in this scene? What, what, what's the, when he says, when, when he uses this, this dykesis, this, this and that, uh, place, place him here by me, do thou for him stand. Who's the fool in this exchange? Lear, Lear. Dost thou call me fool boy, all thy other titles thou hast given away, that thou wast born with, Kent, this is not altogether fool, my lord. So this is, this is one of these early moments in which inversion, handy dandy, topsy turviness, uh, is, uh, is still a, 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 a part of the professional apparatus of the allowed or licensed fool. It's still something that Lear can approve or disapprove. It's still in the realm of uh, the political slash domestic. That is to say, he is hired to do this in the household. He's hired to be the, the, the one figure who can presume to undercut royalty without. I mean, contrast this to the other person who is called fool at the end of the play, Cordelia, who made the same set of representations to Lear and was punished for it. In this case, this, the, the, uh, 
uh, the fool is not punished for it. But what happens to the fool when he is removed from the court setting is that that whole notion of what a fool is changes. And because the, the counterpoint that was involved in high, low, king, fool, master, servant, uh, witty versus you know, the, 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 the social corrective involved in having a, 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 a staged employee who's able to speak truth to power here uh, is very different once they're actually thrust out of doors, once, they, once, once Lear himself learns this lesson firsthand rather than just in this analogizing way. Uh, and that's the point when one could say uh, that the fool in the, the, the storm scenes becomes an aspect of Lear rather than his onstage counterpoint. That there's a sense in which the, the, the fool uh, or the fool persona becomes appropriated by or, or identified with Lear. Um, is this a help in, in, in terms of, so that, that, that when, when you get to the storm scene and the, 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 he, he, he's shivering and the wonderful moment where they find this, 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 this straw and uh, the, this, this unregarded kind of hovel that Lear suddenly is attracted to and he says to the fool, in boy, go first. So again, here, I mean, this, the theme is the last shall be first. It reminds us of Cordelia, the last and least, but, but, but it reminds us of the Bible. But it's also a, a, a humanizing of that relationship in which you'll notice in the passage that I just read to you, uh, the, 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 the cheeky voice of the fool calls the king boy, pretending to exchange their, their status here. Yes? This is, uh, this is just a small thing, really, but um, I, uh, you're bringing a boy there, I thought is interesting, because you have uh, the fool through the entirety of the play refers to Lear as uncle, and right. uh, Lear in return refers to him as boy. So you have that sort of reflection of the sort of theme of family and, of course, the inevitable inversion of that. Yeah, the, this nuncle is a kind of nursery term for uncle. It's a familiar, again, the, the, the fool's allowed to be familiar in a way that nobody else can be. So the, 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 the transfer of the term fool from, from uh, the court fool to Cordelia is something that many critics have noticed. Uh, some people think that the same actor who played the fool uh, plays the part of Cordelia, so that when the fool departs from the play in the middle, I'll go to bed at noon, that's when Cordelia re-enters from France. Certainly we're told that since my young lady's departing into France, the fool has must much pined away. Whether or not it's the same actor, there's some kind of relation to them, so that when you have this extraordinary scene at the end, which is almost al always played like a pieta, uh, at where, where uh, Lear says, my poor fool is hanged, he's talking about Cordelia. But there's a sense in which the intimacy of his relationship with the fool is far more so than the rather formal relationship that he has with his beloved daughter or daughters at the beginning of the play, that he stages their affection for him in a way that, that makes that affection a demand rather than a gift. And the, I mean, this, this is the demand for love. And the demand for love can never be offered in quite this way. It never is met. It's never going, no matter if she'd said this, the script right, he, it would not have been enough for him. She, in fact, says what's behind these other things. But it's never enough. It's never enough. Because the, the, the demand for love at the beginning of this play is, is endless. The, and, and when she says, why have my sisters husbands if they say they love you all? This is not only, I mean, as it clearly is, since we, I mean, we see in many Shakespeare plays the necessity for the young woman to, as we see perfectly in Desdemona, saying she sees here a divided duty, you are my, the lord of duty, but here I see my husband to whom I now owe, owe a duty, this, this growing up gesture that young women in the play often do in which they, they turn away from the father 
and choose the, the husband. She's claiming that the sisters are either lying or being infantile and in saying that they love their father all. But he doesn't even hear it as all. He hears it only as part, because with the, part, the part that's missing is the, is the Cordelia part. And I, you know, if one could imagine her saying something that o would overtop Regan, I would guess that there would still be some residue of thing, something unsatisfied for him because what he what he's demanding is not only obedience but perfect love, and that the play is suggesting is uh, will always escape somehow, uh, so that the intimacy with the fool and the and the and the, and the uh, familiarization of the fool is this familiar language this nursery language is very different from the language that he uses with them uh, at the beginning of the play. Now again, remember that we're talking about a 16th or an 8th century or 16th century uh, royal household in which uh, daddy doesn't come home from work and play with you with your, in your, your dollhouse, uh, that these are, the children are fostered out, that they are, they're, that they're raised, they have their own apartments and so forth. So we're not, one is to expect uh, a 1950s family here. But uh, the, nonetheless, the formality of this relationship it seems very much at odds with his, with with the the, uh, the demand for the intimate at the same time that is the demand for the political. Let's look at um, let's look at Edmund's speech for uh, and and then maybe at at one of Lear's in Act One, Scene Two. Uh, let's look at Edmund's "Thou Nature Art." my goddess speech. It's the very beginning of Act 1. In fact, it's, it's the all of Act 1, Scene 2. Um, Thou, nature, art my goddess. To thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me? Were that I am some 12 or 14 moonshines lag of a brother? Why bastard? Wherefore base, when my dimensions are as well compact, my mind is generous and my shape is true as honest madam's issue? Why brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy, base, base, when the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed go to the creating of a whole tribe of fops got tweet sleep and wake? Well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate. Fine word, legitimate. Well, my legitimate. If this letter's speed and my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now gods stand up for bastards. Now what's, what's, what's happening rhetorically in this speech? First of all, tell me about the um, about the style. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. <laughs> it's a soliloquy. Big one. It's a soliloquy. It is a soliloquy, absolutely. And he is. That's his form. Yes, mm -hmm. and he is explaining to the audience, he speaks directly to the audience, not to another character. Right. In fact, he does that throughout the play, mostly. Right. Now, he, at the beginning of, this, of the speech, he purports to be addressing somebody who, who might be the audience, but, but it, it is an apostrophe, thou nature art my goddess. Uh, so there is a, a purported speaker, but it's, a, it's an abstract speaker rather than. Mm -hmm. What else? He's also addressing um, a cultural issue that that bastard children are are put in this negative light, and he's addressing nature and saying, you know, we're the same thing, and what's what's this that culture is doing to us? And he's flipping upside down all the language that's used, so base and legitimate, and you know, what does all that mean? Um, and I also like it, I don't, maybe I'm off with this, but I feel like at the end, you know, stand up for the bastards, the groundlings in the theater would particularly like this and see something in him for doing that. 
there's something very energetic about the whole whole speech. Why why Brad asked with bastards with base bastardy base base. I mean, there, there's something enormously self-generated about this. He he in a way performs the energy that he's describing here. You can see why these Lear girls would find him attractive. Uh, there's something well, I can see that because he's very energetic. He's very self-starting. He's uh, he's a self-made man. Um, and he, uh, his invention will thrive. I want you to think about the, the, the end of the first scene of, 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 or the first act, I should say, of, of Othello, in which you see uh, Iago saying, I have it, Helen Knight shall bring this, this monstrous birth to the, the world's light. Where it's, again, the engendering of an idea, the invention of an idea. He's got a plot. He has a letter, he's written something down, he has scripted something which is going to have some effect. And he's, he's going to, it's going to have an effect by his first pretending that it's nothing and then showing it and say, he says nothing but the truth. He says it's nothing, I'm sure he didn't mean it. Uh, everything he says, taken straight so to speak, uh, would, would, would disallow the value of what it is. But in fact he performs it in such a way as to suck his father into this. So once again, it's about interpretation. Is this uh, Shakespeare ringing the alarm bells? I mean, just sort of saying, well, here's another Iago. I mean, th this guy's you know, a dreadful character because I mean, he's in that same speech. I mean, you're reading it in a positive way, but you can also read it in a very negative way. This is a, 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 he's turned everything around. He's, um, he's trying to make um, good out of evil and, and, um, and justifying um, things which are coming I mean, we almost know, having read that, that later on this guy's going to be up to lots of bad things. Well, the, the, uh, I, would s I would say that to a, s a little extent you're reading backwards from what we do know. I mean, for, you read the whole play. If you just get to this, there's certainly a sense in which he's up to something and he has a scheme. And he's going to turn things upside down. The base are going to top the legitimate. And so, I mean, we're going to, the, 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 the handy dandy inversion theme that we see with the fool, that we see with the last and least, and so forth, is also present here. But the question of what he's going to do now, well, my legitimate, I must have your land. That's, that's the moment of plotting. Uh, so, precisely, he's an anarchic energy. There's no question about that. But whether he is yet a figure of evil, I mean, he, maybe he's a figure of evil in the sense that we talked about with, with the, the speech on degree in Ulysses, that his, his energy, he's like the appetite a universal wolf will, will, will turn upon itself. Uh, but but I, I, there is, I, theatrically speaking, there's something very appealing about this character, I think. Uh, he, I mean, wicked though he is. But let me just hear from some other people on this question. Mel, please, that we have, uh, uh, so over here in front of. In reading it today, he seems very modern. I mean, he's, it, he's modern. Very modern, because he's, he sounds like an individual standing yes. up against right, that's good. class. That's good. That there, there's, he, he's railing against his fate. He will not be, be, be pigeonholed. He will not, you know, the fact that he has no uh, cultural baggage means that he is an independent operator. There is that sense of self-invention. Here. I'm not trying to make him the hero exactly. I just want to show you something about his energy at this moment in the play, as contrasted with the scriptedness of the of the division of the kingdom, and a different moment of taking land. Because the theme is the same: take land. Who's going to take land? Right in front. No, no, no. Sorry. The, the lady, and then the gentleman, please. No, right there. Yes, yes, the lady in the white sweater, please. She says no. She says no. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I've, See, I've, nothing will come with nothing. There we go. <laughs> this notion of, uh, of the anti-hero, though, it, I'm wondering how modern that idea is, and I'm wondering whether how Shakespeare's audience would have responded to this character and his proclamation. At the beginning of the play, I sense that Edmund's humiliation his public humiliation with his father's discussion of his breeding. And Kent tries to smooth that over, saying, well, he's a, he's a pretty, pretty good-looking guy for, for all of that. You can see why Edmund's angry, uh, but this statement, God stand up for bastards, I'm just curious to know what, what uh, the, the contemporary response to that assertion would be. 
whether they would see that as an interesting negative energy or something abhorrent. Uh, it depends upon the context, I think. Uh, so there, there are a lot of bastards in this culture. Some of them are, there they're, they're actually very positive characters in Shakespeare's play is called the bastard. Uh, so an illegitimate birth is not, I mean, the, so the whore son must, must be acknowledged is what, what Gloucester says. He hasn't hidden this guy away. This isn't the foundling story where Edmund, Edmund has to come through all kinds of obscurity to say, you're my father and you've been disinherited me. Uh, he's acknowledged. He's just not given a, a, um, an inheritance here. Um, the, uh, these figures of negative energy in plays of this period are very popular figures. This is the character of the Machiavelli or the Vice. Uh, the Jew of Malta begins by talking about how he likes to go about, about at night and poison wells. These were enormously powerful and popular theatrical characters, so it's not as if people ran in horror from them. It's the fascination of evil that you see in almost any kind of, of text. How they would have morally judged his position is a different question, I think. Mel, behind you, please, the gentleman in green. It's very, yeah. it's very uh, Luciferian. It's like a, he's like a Lucifer uh, character in Paradise Lost. I mean, that would be like a kind of an archetypal figure already in, in the tradition. Yeah, well, the, well the, the, the Satan or Lucifer in Paradise Lost it partakes of this notion of Machiavelli. And Paradise Lost is, in fact, was the original version of Paradise Lost was a, a drama rather than a, an epic poem, and was very much influenced by precisely these these figures. Uh, so, so um, yes, it, I mean, it's a, it's a figure who precisely because he's self-invented uh, can do anything. Or not. but but think of, think about him in, for example, in contrast with the fool, who also is self-inventing, but is self-inventing within a different kind of script. Behind you, please, Mel, right there. Um, yeah. I, I think that Edmund is appealing because he feels wronged. He's not just doing evil. There's, um, you understand why he is, and Goneril and Regan feel wronged. No wonder they love him. Um, and Lear feels wronged. Everybody feels wronged. And um, do you blame the gods or do you blame your family? Does Cordelia feel wronged, do you think? Except her. She, 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 right, as, as you said. Right, yeah. right. But she, she we never, when no cause, no cause, I mean, she's never, it's like Desdemona at the end of the play. Nobody, I myself, farewell, that she refuses to assign blame. And if she blames anybody, it's herself. I didn't speak. Uh, or in Desdemona's case, I must have done something inadvertent. Here, please. Yes. Um, I just wanted to surface in um, Edmund's speech that he, th he suggests that bastards are not only as good as legitimate children, but even better, because right. more energy went into their begetting <laughs> than, um, than the legitimate child, where it was kind of boring, the tribe of everyday the business. Exactly. Yes, yes. and then... That at the end, that, that famous line at the end, now God stand up for bastards, that's so non Iago, I think, that, that, um, that Edmund is usually played by an extremely appealing and energetic young man. And right. when he says, now God stand up for bastards, you all feel like standing up in the audience and cheering for him. You know, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, this is part of my point in trying to draw your attention to this is a very rousing right. speech. It's the whole scene is this speech. And, and you're quite right about this dull, tired tribe. Now, w when we heard uh, Gloucester talking about it, it was sort of like that, too. Uh, there was good sport at his making, and the horse must be, be acknowledged, that there's, there's, there's actually more description of uh, Gloucester's mistress than of the Duchess of Gloucester or of Queen Lear. I mean, the, both of these figures get mentioned very, very peripherally and only functionally, only as sort of if, if you were not if you were not legitimate, then my, my wife is an adulteress, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, isn't, isn't also part of um, Edmund's appeal that anyone who was not born into this, anyone who was not born into um, sort of a life of nobility or just a life of knowing exactly what's going, you know, knowing exactly what your future is, what you're going to get and what's going to come to you, Anyone who doesn't have that can, in a sense, sympathize with Edmund. Yeah, now again, this is a noble bastard. That is to say, a nobly born bastard. Uh, there are actually you know, morally noble bastards elsewhere in Shakespeare. So to be bastard is not automatically to be, hello. Uh, yes, thank you, Mel, very much. We're, we, we have class here till 7.30.
Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's look at another couple of passages in the time that we have left. Let's look at Lear's uh, Reason Not the Need speech in Act 2, Scene 2, line 450, just about. Uh, this is at that moment of stripping where, where they say, that I have 50 to get to double five and 20, thou art twice, twice her love. Uh, what need you five and 20, 10 or five, to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you? Regan, what need one? I mean, it's a fabulous play, and it's wonderfully, wonderfully staged. And now we have another superb Shakespearean set piece. Can I read it first? Okay. Oh, reason not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest thing superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm were gorgeous, why, nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearest, which scarcely keeps thee warm. But for true need, you heavens, give me that patience, patience I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stirs these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger, and let not women's weapons, water drops, stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags, I will have such revenges on you both that all the world shall... I will do such things, what they are, yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep. No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws, or ere I'll weep. O oh, fool, I shall go mad. Notice that in the midst of the ending of this speech, nature chimes in with the storm and tempest, just at the point where he says, you think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. The rain begins to fall. The nature does weep for him. What do you, given what we've been talking about um, throughout this, this hour or so, what words leap out at you from this speech that seem to have now a renewed richness? Unnatural. Unnatural. Uh, you are natural hags. Uh, why, why does unnatural have a specific re resonance for you now? I think it's, this is a very good word to observe because it, it, as he says it all nature breaks loose around him right well remember the speech begins with reason not the need uh, uh, the allow not nature more than nature needs man's life is cheap as beasts but also remember that we just had Edmund's an evocation to nature as well so that we have the and what is natural here what is a natural relationship between a, a, what is a bond, now that we've taken that word off the board. What else, what other works, words? What about this word superfluous? Where, where else in the play do we hit, hit this word superfluous? Gloucester. Gloucester, thank you. What does he say? Uh, he says that um, uh, we, should, we should distribute our wealth. Uh, yes. Uh, when he's in his, in, in his extremity. And, in Act Four, to shake the superflux to them, to show the heavens more more just. So this notion of superfluity, of having more than nature needs again, this question of less and more, of accommodation and unaccommodation, and a big fancy word like superflux here, superfluous. A superflux means, and in, in when Gloucester uses it, it, means we have extra we should give. Here. Uh, it's the superfluous and the lust dieted man. It has that modern sense of superfluous too, somehow, like your fops, that, 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 that because he's so wealthy uh, and privileged, he actually uh, is a caricature of himself. That, that this notion of superfluous has taken on a kind of moral edge to it or a kind of ethical edge to it, the superfluous or lust dieted man. Here, our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. What does superfluous mean in this context? They have things that they don't 
Yeah, even, even beggars, even beggars have more than they need. That it's not only the wealthy, but everybody, that, that their, their need is not what we're talking about here. It's not about need. And this quite, when we talked earlier about the demand for love here, we could talk about need and how why it's not about need. It's about gifts, generosity. It's about something that has nothing to do with an equation, nothing to do with need and want here. Uh, I mean, this, this whole speech about why need is the wrong, why do you need one night, why do you need 50 nights, it's not about the need. It's about a different kind of accommodation, true need. You haven't given me that patience, patience I need. Uh, by this point, notice that he has already become a poor old man. That He's become stripped in this way. And he's looking at himself as on that age divide and that gender divide at the same moment. Um, what about this, this request for revenge here? I will have such revenges on you both that all the world shall. And that's the point at which he breaks off and can't think of what it will do. It points up his utter helplessness in the situation, uh, to me. I mean, he's, he's making threats he knows he can't, he can't uh, follow through on. Um, but if he, I think that's right. But if he had been able to revenge, what kind of play would it have been? I mean, it would have been a revenge play, obviously, but, but what, 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 uh, what would be lost if he had been able to revenge? According to what he says here? Okay. Yeah, a kind of holocaust. I mean, a kind of leveling of everything. That's what would, that, that's, yes, he would have, the revenges would have, have so what, what is, what, so I wouldn't put it the other way, what is gained by not revenging? I, I don't understand your question. What happens to Lear as a result of his not taking this path that he, at this moment, claims that he wishes to be able to take? He's forced to learn a lesson. I, that, that is to say, he has no power, so he has, he has to deal with life in a different way than he's dealt with it before. He has, mm -hmm. to, to, come to, some, he has to come to some accommodation with his own right. helplessness. Right. Good, good. What's the stage sign of, of fealty in this play? What do people do on stage in order to show where power is? Yes. They kneel. They kneel. Yes. So who kneels to whom in this play? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, he kneels. He, he, he kneels to, to Cordelia. She says, do not kneel. Uh, they both kneel. At the, in, the, in the scene with, with the two daughters, the this, this stripping scene, uh, there's a sense in which they, they seem to sort of mock him by kneeling. Um, there's this question of who kneels to whom and of whether a physical sign of, of, and a stage sign here of fealty is something that needs to be turned upside down is also functioning in this, scene, this, this speech. Why does it break off the way it does? The, uh, all the world shall, I will do such things, what they are yet I know not. Uh, why? why why these self-interruptions, do you think? I'm, I'm not sure if this explains it fully, but they are still his daughters, and he's not, um, I guess he hasn't gone quite mad to the extent that he, um, that he can come up with all these awful things that he wants to do with that, do to them. Well, it, 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 it is, we, we talked about his, in, in, I mean, this is a kind of, uh, this is going to be an overstatement, but a kind of rhetorical impotence, that he does not have the power to do these things. And he's, he, he's desperate to not fall into this category of weeping woman and so forth. And then he goes into the storm scene where he encounters aspects of his own persona. And he, uh, he submits himself to a different kind of patience to a kind of, of, of human experience that is different from the king has revenge or the god has revenge. Yes, back there, please. Um, I, I was struck, and it kind of to dovetail into what you're saying, I was struck by all the plural nouns in this, that, that it's the drops, uh, the revenges, and then, and then it ends on you know, his heart, this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws. And it's just so beautiful, like all those, it's, it's like shrapnel. <laughs> it's yes. like everything's yeah. coming apart and, yeah. and then, then taking it to the whole division of the kingdom. And everything's dividing. Everything's like just spraying apart. And so I think that perhaps it ends there 
for almost for that emphasis as well, that he kind of drops it off because nothing's going to be complete anymore. It's all fractured, even his language. I think that, 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 that's extremely good. That's extremely powerful. All right, so quick question. Why does Cordelia have to die? Why is name Kate wrong to keep her alive? Okay. She seems almost too good for the world. So she needs to, I mean, uh, so the, is, is, is the effect then upon us or upon Lear or upon? Well, her death complete, completes the, um, the, the tragedy in, in the sense that the, 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 the whole world has been shown to be so fraught with, with evil. Uh, and her, her existence, her continued existence seems impossible. Okay, good, and behind you, please. Cordelia represents the hope for redemption. She is the heart of the play, as her name says, uh -huh. her, her uh, Latin name says. And in the beginning, uh, King Lear is just a powerful king. He has authority, but he lacks heart. And he will achieve heart after his uh, uh, um, little uh, daughters, after his little daughters dies. And in this way, he will receive uh, heart uh, just by losing his heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, I like that. Good. Uh, gentleman here in the switcher. Um. Um, well, in the way that uh, she's described, too, where there she shook the holy water from her heavenly yeah. eyes, and yeah. the sunshine and rain at once, her smiles and tears were like a better way. It's like the death of a martyr. Yes, it is. It is, or and I, I think I probably raised this question a little bit when I wrote about it. What happens when there's sunshine and rain at once? There's a rainbow, so there's this promise of something else too, that that it is like the death of a martyr. That that her 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 death, uh, you really do hope that she's not going to die, and then he thinks he can bring her with this feather stir as she lives. That that you have this, and keep your eye on this attempt. We saw it in Desdemona, the attempt to re to resurrect her. We see it here, this attempt to resurrect her. We will see it in the romances, again, the attempt to resurrect the de dead woman. And what will happen in the romances is that it actually will occur. Before you go, just let's look at the very, very last lines of the play, sometimes assigned to, to Edgar and sometimes assigned to Albany. I just want to read you these last four lines and say just one word about them. The weight is, oh, first, first we have Kent. The, the, the idea is that, that Kent should remain, no, no. I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me, I must not say no. So not only is he continuing to follow Lear as he done through, throughout the play, but his last word is no, I must not say no. Never, 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 no cause, no cause, nothing, my lord. To not say no is, to, is, is, is both to say no and yes. Edgar, the weight of this sad time, we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest hath borne most. We that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. So I want to know who are we that are young? Edgar. Edgar, Edgar, Edgar certainly. Uh, who else? Us, us. Uh, this is definitely the we that speaks out to the audience, that we speak, of, speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. This is definitely that gesture out to the audience in which we are the survivors, and we are the diminished survivors. And this is the kind of greatest generation phenomenon in which the, 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 those left on the stage, those left in the audience, can only have an extremely scattered and shattered notion of what has taken place. And the only that way that we can encounter it is by speaking what we feel and not what we ought to say, which is, after all, the request that was made at the beginning of the play by Lear to Cordelia, where he didn't mean it when he asked her for it. So this is the re return of that question again. Speak what you feel, not what you ought to say. Um, Macbeth, next time. Uh, I'll see you then.